Well, uh, while we're passing around the scientific devices, I'll go ahead and get started. So hi, I'm Wendy, and I'm in from the Arkansas area. I'm not a native Arkansan, but I have adopted it in the past uh, 13 years, and I'm really loving it. Um, I currently work both at Northwest Arkansas Community College, primarily teaching hybrid sections to freshmen and sophomore kind of non-STEM students until I can hypnotize them, OK? <laughs> And oftentimes, a lot of pre-college, middle uh, childhood, or elementary ed teacher candidates, whether they know that's what they're going to choose to do or, or not. I'm also affiliated with the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, where I teach adjunct online. I used to be there full time as faculty, and for family obligations, chose to move and then join them as adjunct. So I hold two con contingent positions and stay active in my field. By background and training, I am a research scientist who has gone over to that other good side because they have better cookies, um, <laughs> geoscience education. So with that, I was asked to come and speak about diversity in terms of persons with disabilities. I personally like to um, use a pedagogical or andragogical model that's called universal design so that if you're establishing the environment of learning and the tools that you use and the modalities that you use while you're teaching, it universally reaches out to the variety of learning preferences as well as the majority of persons with disabilities. Okay. Anybody not get what they want? Okay, thank you. If you'll just set those there, I appreciate you very much. That was also the aerobic component of the workshop this afternoon. And before I go off of the screen, what I'd like to show you is that. This is called a word cloud. It's often used in education. And essentially, it's another way to show a variety of different types of content that you want to share. And in this case, that's a word cloud that if you have color vision abilities, you'll see there's different colors in there and that there's different orientations of words of populations that represent diversity, at least in my classrooms, whether it's at the 2YC, two-year college, or at the 4YC, like at UA Little Rock. My freshman and sophomore students in these public institutions are essentially identical. Um, and then this young man here is actually using assistive technology that, and his dog is sleeping here or on call. There is a, a guide dog that is in that picture as well. Well, he's using assistive technology that has helped equalize the learning environment. And so it's not specifically a geology classroom in this case, but it is part of the resource center that has um, provided resources to myself as a faculty and to the students and to other people that need those. So there you go. All right. I have brought a bunch of tchotchkes. That's not an Arkansan phrase. I'm also from the East Coast. Um, one of the organizations that I'm actually here on behalf of today is the International Association of Geoscience Diversity. And in this term, diversity represent persons with disabilities. And so Chris Atkinson uh, kindly sent large stuffed envelopes to my home. And the mailman tried to shove them in the mailbox, but got that personal service at the, the door. And there's some business cards that show the website. So if, as you go on break, you would like to get those, please do. And there are more here than there are participants in this workshop. So please take them and disseminate them. I have more at home. The other um, thing I would like to share with you, in addition to IAGD, and I was really uh, happy that Rebecca mentioned that there's going to be some wonderful field-based activities at the GSA meeting in Vancouver, is some of the other are some of the other caps that I wear or I have uh, been able to contribute to or have benefited from as a faculty over the last couple decades. One of them that I have brought some various handouts. Um, not all of them are counts n equal 29, so just take one or two, and it has the basics for you to get to the website. Is the National Association of Geoscience Teachers, which more broadly speaking is interdisciplinary. And we have people that not only are pre K to 12th grade, but more focusing on higher ed into grad school, but beyond just geoscience. We've got chemists and physicists and astronomers and all the other good things that integrated. We know all those Venn diagrams overlap, right? And so please take a look at that. Right now I'm serving as a counselor to the executive committee and have um, had the privilege of being able to learn a more, lot more about a, a variety of projects. The other thing is, is that I'm more recently appointed to the board of directors for Triangle Coalition for STEM Education. 
used to be just known as Triangle Coalition. Triangle, I believe, comes from the DC area and some of the jargon that's used for the triangle. And so I have provided this because I understand from Stephanie that you guys are going to have access to these presentations. So those are clickable links. If you go see the triangle, it's not specifically about diversity, but it is about STEM and it includes diversity. And I would like you to consider having your institution become part of that coalition and then have that institution recommend people to be elected to the board so that we could start having a more diverse board. Okay. Um, there's diversity there now, not only an in institution type, but also that it has components from K-12. It's got people in the workforce, major um, professional societies, those kinds of things. Some of the materials that I'm bringing to you and will be showing you are actually part of some current and previously NSF funded activities that also fall under NAGT uh, memberships at PIs or how it's administered for free uh, out to the public. And so if you would please consider NAGT resources at the very least, but the best scenario is please join because this helps us sustain our activities. Okay. And for a moment, I want to show you, for instance, using the hat under 2YC to your college, there's a wonder, wonderful new situation that's been going on, a grant called Supporting and Advancing Geoscience Education into your colleges. It's been very focused upon supporting student success, which I think overarches a lot of the things that have been discussed yesterday and today and will be tomorrow. Workforce, careers, broader issues. There's a variety of workshops. So please take a look at that. Let me see if I can close out of this. Hmm. Options at this time of day? Let me yeah. shrink that down. Mm -hmm. I'm a morning person. OK. So what I would like to share with you today is shifting gears to, I think, a topic that overarches all the other types of diversity that we've been talking to at this point. At any point, ethnic racial, um, economic status, gender identity, any of this, we will have persons with disabilities or persons with varied learning preferences. Style is not really the choice uh, according to education and cognition specialists, so learning preferences. It overarches all of that. So um, I'm bringing to you an idea of pedagogy and andragogy. Andragogy being pedagogy that's applied to adult learners. Okay. So I hope that we can just look at some of the major needs of learners that are persons with disabilities, whether they're visible disabilities. We saw a picture earlier today of a young man with a um, me mechanized wheelchair. Um, got to use software to auditorize his presentation in the past, so we saw that. Uh, you've got persons that have invisible disabilities, might be cognition or learning disabilities, but these people could be sitting among us right now, either self-identified or not. And so with using universal design, hopefully that you can use best teaching practices, set a comfortable and safe environment to reach out. If you can reduce the barriers, you can reduce the fear of it not being a safe environment, you can allow those synapses to focus on the learning. Okay. And then if a few minutes permit at the end, I have a, a mini think pair share two questions. We can pick a question from that that might be able to advance what your goals are. Okay. Do not expect you to read all this. I have brought, because this is a, a synopsis of a very large and growing field. On the front counter are some one-page handouts that have generated through the 2YC workshops that I showed you before. And some of these are just a synopsis of best practices for teaching first-generation students and some resources, so always research-based. Strategies to reduce stereotype threat, not only the definition of what it is, but a primary resource for you. Um, students that have science, math, and nature phobic. Yes, nature phobic. No child left inside. Um, a number of resources there. Teaching English language learners. We have folks like that in all of our class settings, and the techniques under universal design uh, can help with that teaching neurodiverse students under that category includes students that are lying along the autism spectral disorder continuum. And teaching veterans, those that are recently returning, maybe having some traumatic brain disorder or other issues. So I invite you to take this home with you as well. 
if you have a chance to scan this, you'll see here's some best practices for ELL, English language learners, or here are something, uh, something that we can do for students with disabilities. Even if the subtitles are not exactly the same, they are addressing the same types of techniques that you would use in a classroom or a field setting. And however your classroom is actually disseminated, as you work on it, it can be fully face-to-face. -face. It can be a hybrid environment where you meet with the students part of the time face-to-face, -face, and then you use a course management system to de deliver, or fully online. Um, and then this other phrase. How many of you have seen that hyphenated phrase before? Learner-centered, yes. That means don't be the sage on the stage. Turn that classroom and that learning around to them where it's more of the students being engaged. So when we sit in this type of format, that's not actually modeling best learner-centered techniques, but you have to have a little bit of all types of ways to get the message across. We at the two YCs, uh, definitely at Northwest Arkansas Community College, we are all about learner-centered. And if we provide in-house um, professional development to colleagues, or we invite people in on title monies, Title III or Title IX, to come and work with our community, we have to align it to things that are under learner-centered categories that we have devised to make sure that we're staying on target as professional development for our mission for our community college. Under universal design, and um, I'm not going to parse this, it comes in many different words. I've noticed universal design of instruction, universal design of learning. There's a couple other words hanging off of it these days because I think people are trying to create their own titles, to make their own publications, to say this is my ownership. It's very hard to search the literature for UD, universal design techniques, because there isn't a common lexicon. And so some of the resources I brought to you actually talk about that and do give you some resources outside of STEM fields. In fact, some of the most informative um, papers that I have read and been exposed to, I went to a colleague at the Disability Resource Center. I said, what is your professional organization? It's a head, and I cannot at this moment remember what all that stands for. Um, and she kindly shared her access information to me so that I could go search the databases because they don't rotate out their articles um, to be free like NAGT does after a while. They put the Journal of Geological Educa Geosciences Education out there. So have some articles referenced here for you that may be of interest in their outside discipline. So this is that cross-disciplinary connection that's very important for us. Under UD, you want to emphasize using cooperative learning, different ways, multimodal instruction, performance-based assessments. It's not all about just quizzes and exams in the traditional format. Project-based learning, multi-sensory ways of teaching, whether or not that student is vision impaired or blind or uh, deaf. People that have those abilities can still learn by using some of these very tactile models or sonification. Have you heard of this? Auditorizing of data sets. And so this is the kind of stuff that you can blend into your UD environment. Recognize that there are multiple intelligences and appreciate it. Okay, And again, student-centered, learner-centered uh, ways of doing that. Because you get this PowerPoint, these are clickable links. And these are some powerhouses on universal design, at least in the United States. I know there's a comparable um, series of entities over in the UK that are doing this, and they're starting to communicate with one another. And in some way or other, they have been either funded in part by National Science Foundation or Department of Education, NIH, a variety of larger organizations helping in this respect. Okay. One of those organizations that I encourage you to go visit is CAST. And here's the website. And this is just a single portal entry uh, screenshot for you because I want you to know behind this is best practices based on cognition research. And this goes beyond my geosciences expertise. So this is where I appreciated Juan this morning talking about working with social scientists and, and cognition research. There are a lot of embedded clickable links at the active web page and many ways for you to explore how maybe you can bring this into your environment. Just going to leave it there because of time. So um, to address blindness or low vision, variety of hearing impairments, mobility issues. And we're going to see this increasing, not that a student has necessarily been born with a mobility issue, or even a faculty member has been born with a mobility issue. One of the things we have going on right now is baby boomers, and we're all 
not we're all, I'm all <laughs> aging, okay? And so we get variation in mobility as we get older, okay? And I do have a colleague in the sciences who's very well respected for his geoscience that early in his life he had polio. He went into remission, he was good, and now that he is in his 50s and 60s, he is now back down to very limited ability and on a scooter and hand mobility issues where he can't do things like he used to. But he's still a very alive scientist, and so he's really um, interested in these kinds of things. Access STEM. This is through an organization that started at as uh, Do It at Washington State. And I'm going to click that and open an internet window because I want you to see, oh, uh, you know, whatever. Excuse me. All right. Lots of resources here. This is an open browser. And you can go and see just the fundamentals of universal design. There's a search engine. So you could say, you know, is there a way to apply universal design to geology? It's going to tell you no. It's going to say zero. So then you think, OK, synonyms, synonyms. Earth science, bam, you've got lists. So be persistent on the words that you use, OK? Because it started mostly in the K-12 venue, use the words that we know are being used under K-12 frameworks and standards. Um, accommodation strategies, some uh, tutoring on the legalities. That's hard to keep up to date. So always, if there's a question, contact your resource officer on the campus about disability resources under whatever title they have. But this is a page specific for how to access STEM. And when I use these things, I keep thinking in the back of my mind how to really open up the STEM fields to a variety of people for their contributions. Okay? So this is on that um, link for you as well. Fortunately, it's hard to see what I'm closing. That's a subliminal, no, that's a superliminal yeah. message. Yeah, that's by design. OK, so we're sitting here. We ate a couple hours ago. I see it. So let's jiggle our minds, OK? It's mid-afternoon. You had an opportunity to pick up six pieces of scientific equipment, right? So let's take a moment to consider a problem. And these are the tools that you were offered. You were offered something like a wooden toothpick, preferably round, so it didn't have a preferred side. Some coffee stirrers, eh, straws, in this case, flexi bendy straws. I usually have, well, I go to Sam's Club and I buy 3,000 straws for $6, and they're in white paper, and they're clear and straight. Okay, So I get these little tools, and I use this as an icebreaker with my own students in geology and physical science classes. Okay. One, it's just something different, and they haven't experienced a science teacher before necessarily that does silly, silly things in class. Oh, they know how silly it is by the end of 16 weeks. Anyway, so you're offered a selection as a method of universal design. It's not one size fits all. So if you have the ability for certain learning modules that you're doing, you think of a variety of ways to provide the supplies, sizes, shapes, textures. You allow the students to select. That's a big driver in UD. Because if you have a student that has a hand mobility issue, you might find that they, and if they can grip, they will choose the straws because it's larger. Or especially the straws that have paper because there's those little flexible paper edges on the end that might be easier to hang on to. OK. This is what I need you to do. And I don't have a marker over here, but um, OK, I'm stepping out of field. TV here. OK. So here is your assignment. Please keep your eyes to yourself. <laughs> I'm the age group where they used to set up record albums between the little kids. But do your own work. Stay on task. So the objects that you selected should all be the same length. OK? So what I'm asking you to do are from those six objects, can you see if I write here? OK. I need you to make four equilateral triangles. So here are the instructions written. This is part of UD. Not only do you auditorize, and you try to do it by facing the audience members. So if somebody is reading your lips, they have that opportunity. So this is what I'd like you to do. You have six items, all the same length. I would like you to make four equilateral triangles. However, 
you need to use the full original length of those objects. What does that mean? No braiding them, no crossing them over. Please don't pull out those straws that have the flexi part. Okay? So now we'll take that quiet educational pause to allow your learners to start focusing on the task at hand. And you're the learner, so go ahead and start. Not yet. There's a time for individual reflection and doing, and there's a time for collaborative as well. Yes, so your three straws try to make four equilateral triangles, and please ignore that your straws bend. Pretend that they're straight. They only gave me one choice that day at the store that I stopped at on the way to the airport <laughs> under a time constraint, as you can imagine. Okay. Now, some of you may know. And that's OK if you don't. And if you do, kind of keep it to yourself. First time I did this, I wasn't even in a science workshop. I wasn't in a universal design. I was learning something about business policy at one of the community colleges in Houston. Okay, so hold that thought. <laughs> okay, so let me share with you how it is I figured out how to do it. It just so happened that I'm kind of the person that has blood sugar lows, it's hypoglycemia. And so I had my lunch packed with me at this workshop and it was next to me. And even though it was only nine o'clock in the morning, I was going, mm, I'm kind of hungry. And I started unzipping that bag quietly while I was trying to make my four equilateral triangles. And I got out my grapes and just before it went in my mouth, bing, light bulb. You don't have to stay in the second dimension. I didn't put that constraint on this. So now that you know that you don't have to stay in a plane, in two dimension, what can you do? Can you solve this? Can you make four equal sided triangles in your object? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the three o'clock in the afternoon this time zone. <laughs> okay. So, using the grapes in my case, and in my classrooms, I'll make available things that I don't expect to get back from students, okay, like little mini marshmallows or raisins or, you know, whatever. It doesn't always have to be pretzels and straws. It could be, uh, it, it could be pretzels. It doesn't have to be things that are in, unedible, okay, inedible. So, what are you going to do? You're going to lay a foundation of a three-sided, make it look a little more equilateral than I was able to do in that quick mock-up, okay? That's your base. And then put your other three objects so that they have a point at the apex of that triangle and lift it into the third dimension. And what you've just created now is a three-dimensional volume that has one, two, three, four equilateral triangles. Or those of you that are into the geosciences, you recognize that as possibly silica tetrahedron. Okay, so I often do this early in the semester in a geoscience component to get us starting to think about how we put things together. And first, just how to get our brain to think we don't have to be two dimensional, we could be three and four dimensional even in the geosciences. And review a little bit of mathematics for some of these students that are a little shaky on their math. Okay, this is a type of very low cost, kind of fun, universal design. When you have more time together and you're not necessarily sitting in fixed stadium seating, this is where you can allow collaboration. And definitely, if you have a classroom environment where that semester you have students that do have mobility access issues, prior to doing something like this, you've already started to foster collaborative team activities so that it kind of makes it just part of the norm that maybe one person can do it even if the other person can't. You don't draw attention to the things that they can't do. You draw attention to the positive learning experience. Okay, So that's just a mini UD. You can keep those things. I don't want them back. <laughs> Who knows? TSA is going to think those are something I shouldn't be carrying on the plane. <laughs> OK. So uh, and I'm sorry they're not. OK. Thank you. Any questions on that? All right. So let me go ahead a little bit. So why did we take the time? I just mentioned that to you. It's an example of universal design. You allow the students to pick some of the tools that they can manipulate.
for the abilities that they have. You give them time to reflect quietly, and then you can bring it around to collaborative. You give them little prompts along the way. Like I said, mm, you don't have to be in two dimensions, OK? Um, and then it comes around to a basic thing that you might want to leverage as you're segueing into mineralogy content, for instance. OK, so let's come back around to diversity of students. These word clouds all have the exact same words in them. They're just oriented differently. Different color palettes are used. And because this particular talk and the handouts that I have for you to take talk about veterans, um, minority diversities, age diversities, going from maybe students who are concurrently enrolled in a college level undergraduate class, but they're still in the high school, high school mode, as well as taking your class, high active learning, multi-generation. There's a lot of different ways to approach diversity in your classroom. And so under universal design, um, I wanted you to show that there are tools to start fostering the artistic side of things. So I'm kind of into STEAM, OK? Science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And there's a link to a free uh, Woodle tool, if you will. And under those broad diversities, am I still on? Um, you have the, we saw this list before, including autism spectrum. This comes from that Access STEM or the STEM Do It site. And if you go to that site, it goes into more detail on various ways that you can work with these students. Please don't be overwhelmed with this. Because these various ways that you can work with students you might already be doing, especially if you are working with undergraduates currently. Okay? I know some of you aren't necessarily working directly with students on a day-to-day -day basis during a semester. But the techniques that are used in the classroom, is that something that you can bring into the programs that you're administering as internships over the summer? Um, the ways that they have meetings with you and communicate. Can you bring some of these learning styles forward? Because I guarantee you it's going to make it a more inclusive environment, a more welcoming environment to some students that traditionally have not done well when it's only a sage on the stage. Okay. So now I'm going to shift uh, for a few minutes to deliverables because there's a number of groups in this room that have funding to create your programs and models. And part of that is not only how do you bring it into the educational realm, but then what are the deliverables that you can disseminate out to the world? First of all, I believe everybody has good intentions. And unless you learn about these different techniques from maybe people outside of your field, like geology in my case, you may not even be aware you're doing something that is creating a barrier to somebody's learning. Okay, And so I say it this way. Because I want you to think about this increased use of videos and people using YouTube, for instance, to get out there and get a YouTube channel and to put a video clip on. I teach an online format. And so I keep this in the back of my mind that maybe I want to do a two or three minute instructional clip to get my students started. But if I do it by just doing audio, then I have already precluded folks in my room that semester, maybe. Because in my online format, I have students that don't necessarily identify their disabilities to me because they've heard that I have a pretty good universal design and I reduce barriers to begin with. And so they go through my class already comfortable thinking it's going to be accessible, right? So please don't fall into the trap of just putting it into YouTube and saying, you know what? YouTube auto captioning, that means on the fly as it's going, is going to do it for you. Now, Um, I'm doing this as just a marketing Christmas time example, not any particular religious persuasion. There are these comedians that have been out there. I don't know what that's advertising. I hope it's not bad. Okay. <laughs> if you're working in a K-12 environment, always have this downloaded and, and control that environment. Okay. So anyway, can I have some sound on this? Let me unmute this. So what these guys have done. What it thinks is being said in a video. This time we sang some Christmas carols, then we uploaded those. Let me stop for a second. What they have done is they capitalize on how poorly the auto captioning works. So they chose some Christmas carols that a lot of people in our country might be familiar with because they just hear it at the store, whether or not they're um, in that belief system. And you know what the words are probably supposed to be, and you recognize that. So what they did is they first ran a video through of them singing the song, and that's not going to show here, but them singing it with the proper words. But they're capturing what the auto captioning is saying. Somebody's transcribed that. They take that back and put that on their sheet music, and they start singing what the auto-captioning said that they were saying. 
So let's just take a moment. We won't go the full time, but this link is in the presentation if you're so looking for a hoop. Interpret them. Then we took the interpretation and made those the new lyrics to the old Christmas carols. And now we're going to sing them for you. Yeah, but we probably shouldn't do it here or in these clothes. Um, I'll try. Oh, I see what you're saying. Thank you. I'll get that. We wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Priest Mysterious, your Merry Prisoners, and a Happy New Year. Right. To try it is we, managers came to try, to use for wrestlers set up at the New Year. Although their outside is frightful, but the pirates so delightful, insisted no place to go. There is no that is now, let us know. <laughs> Just match rusting envelope inside. Jet for us nipping at your end. <laughs> what in two do, do sundial clown? And folks, mister that like this too. Read off the rent, those reindeer. And there's anything that will. And if you ever saw an Ewally in St. Louis. <laughs> and we'll end it on that. Uh, I tell you, it gets even funnier. But you know what's not funny? And somebody's honking in the background. What's not funny is you, with your best intentions, have taken your video clip. You've put it in there. You haven't had it professionally or a student workforce kind of person sitting there transcribe the words into the YouTube, YouTube field that would do it so that it reads right. And so. If you were to watch that again, turn the audio off because you're deaf, or your student actually has those facilities, but they want to sit in a meeting and they're multitasking and they don't want anybody to know they're doing it, they're not getting the message you want them to get. And normally it's not quite as funny as what you're seeing here. More it's like, what? Okay? So reflect on what you have out there as a disseminated product through YouTube. And if you've got some work studies or somebody that wants to do a, a project that helps with universal design, get those students in there to quick type it up for you. And at the very least, provide a transcript. Transcript is a good option, but according to my uh, colleagues in Disability Resource, it's better to have it officially captioned. And what else are you doing when you officially caption it? You're spelling words right. And you're helping our English language learners, as well as our new science language learners, get it right. So we're not going to have to dispel misconceptions. So what have I done? Under the Earth Science Literacy Initiative, there has been released a series of wonderful, approximately 10-minute video clips that highlight the nine big ideas. And if you haven't seen those, you need to Google earthscienceliteracy.org. At the time that this was posted, now coming up about four years ago, it was posted through YouTube without captioning, without transcripts. So I had a student contact me with an official letter, and I said, great, we'll make it happen. I was ecstatic that the student gave me their letter. They were deaf, they needed transcription, because that was the piece of paper I could take to the university and say, I must have these resources transcribed officially. Because oftentimes it's need immediately. Mm -hmm. You can't advance design, universal design, unless you have that piece of paper saying there is somebody in your room right this moment or in the next week that needs this captioned. And so now I've gotten to the point where, OK, now people are not telling me they might have hearing disabilities. And I've got this stuff that's been coming out that maybe you've been disseminating that I need captioned. But I can't do it unless I sit down and do it. And well, we know what it's like to be faculty and support staff. Look at that time. So as soon as I get that paper, I go, yay. And I think of all the years worth of stuff I might want to do. And I put it in kind of chunks so that I don't uh, blow a gasket with my colleague over there and take that stuff to him and I get it professionally captioned. And that way I can then, from that point forward, use it not only for the student with that disability letter, but for all of my students in the classroom as universal design. Okay. Um, just going to click on one for a moment because I want to demonstrate to you that although I might have this captioned, there's a couple different ways it is captioned. Ah. What did I do? Sorry. This is actually on a server through the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. And it functions kind of like a real player. You can see where we can click to start. But when you see the full view, there's a point down here at the bottom where you can click on the closed captioning. 
And when it's running, there's an additional captioning that you can click on at the top, which is high contrast, that people have a vision impairment, but they have difficulty with detecting the contrast. So it's telling there's music. If you haven't seen these, these are wonderful. I use this in a lot of pre-college outreach. The kids love it. I don't think I can get you to see the whole screen. Because this is not my laptop, so. Our planet. A not place my laptop, wonder, if you'll do that for me. Especially when something dramatic happens. So if you have the ability to hear, you can hear the narration but of also when it quietly what the narrator's saying. Over time. It is captioned down here. Creating landscapes. Thank you. And I don't think Moving the high contrast captioning place place. clicked on at the top. Okay. Circulating again, air from here. It's, it's there. Back. So just in our frame right here. And providing a home you can for see it's yellow on black. Normally that is long, not what's recommended ago, for PowerPoint. To today. Please, no black backgrounds with yellow or purple. This is the world that very we difficult humans to discern. call home. Now what this is missing is another type of disability captioning that you put in it. How our we haven't gone to that point because this student didn't need that, so that and wasn't on her Earth letter. Science is all about. Figuring out because my student was not blind. So let me show you very quickly a snippet of something time. that was funded through Do It. Understanding where it is now. Uh, I gotta shut that up. What then. may happen to it in the future. And how to care you know, for I embrace technology. our beautiful planet. <laughs> And where did it go? Geoscientists All right, so through Do It, Earth, um, because it is... systems work. <laughs> they study Earth you hear space. that too? Good, it's not just it's me. I appreciate that. All right, hang on just a second. Where did it's that go? It's thin layer of air. It's solid it's surface. Again, it's water. And Earth's deep, deep inside. Geoscientists have the job of studying our planet. Laptop, could you do that? They place sensors in the ground. Believe me, I... I teach with computers all the time, but it's very specific to my computer. Using modern technology to reveal Earth's secrets. <laughs> the research Thank they do is important. That the data out. they collect well, yes. are shared. We can go ahead and get that. Yeah. All right. Let me go back to my PowerPoint, please. This Bye. one. This one, please. Actually, this is subliminal. Okay. That's me. That's me. I'm good. Thank you. My touchpad's very different from this, so excuse me just a second. All right. So we showed you where that you can have the streaming caption that you can toggle off and on um, there. But let me show you now one that has been captioned in a third way. And this is very appropriate for if you also have students that are blind or heavily vision impaired. So. Um, you're going to have the open captioning running across the bottom. I don't believe this one has the high ca contrast captioning. But tell me what you notice is different about this one. Click on it. It didn't. I can't remember. I don't. That was. That had a hyperlink embedded. Sorry. Let's try this. Although they're administrating it through Words the appear uh, here. YouTube Returning channel. from service, college it's and IT careers for veterans. A row of vets disembark from a commercial airplane. Families program. wait behind a rope. Veterans of the Order armed services, you. men and women, Thank you. are returning to higher education campuses so, click on the in captioning. Ever increasing numbers. Backed by veteran tuition benefits and a clear sense of purpose, these students bring to campus experiences that are a world removed from the average 18-year-old college freshman. Robert Etling. Well, we're older, typically. Student veteran. More mature, more focused. We've been in the real world. I'm kind of grown up now, so I have my own car. And so I pay we're my own seeing and I it own captioned own here. Finances. So they're very motivated to succeed. Listen Alan carefully. Carter, and to do whatever is required to learn it because that's why they're here. IT instructor. Behind there is another type of narration, scene description back, captioning. That's what you're hearing auditory. Now, if in you classroom. have a student that actually also needs that caption, there's another way to embed that. Armed forces That's training. a more advanced way of doing it. Robert Etling worked as an army medic. He studied. I recommend, especially since this is computational geosciences, that this is a particularly interesting one to look at because it is for a computer science program in Washington State. So you have the captioning, you have um, 
You have the narration of the description of the scene going on in the background. Not every student needs that. That might become just overwhelming if they're attention deficit disorder. But if it's a student that has vision impairment and they need to have an understanding of what is going on in the background in addition to the words, then please use that. Okay. Um, I've been signaled to start wrapping up. So hang on just a second. All right. The other thing I would like to bring to your attention, and I'm just now learning about this, is that there is a, a group of people in the disabilities arena that are trying to get publishers to create formats called DAISY. And DAISY is Digital Accessible Information Systems. This is the web address. And you could take, for instance, and not so endorsing one product, but you could take Microsoft Word, say 2010 because the newest version still has some bugs. And you can take that document and you can create a transcript or a narrative that you want to be auditorized. And in DAISY, that will work with the adapted technology that certain uh, students use, like the Braille system. Not just the printer to make the Braille on paper, but there are real-time keyboards that have a bunch of little pins. And the student has been trained to actually use that. And as that document is reading, running in the background, or the words are showing, because another student that's vision might be there, the Braille pins are lifting and transforming. So they're getting that haptic by touch input. Okay? Not every blind student knows Braille. And not all Braille is the same. So just keep that in mind. I created a tiny URL, URL because actually the link to that just wrapped around my page about three times. So that's another resource. So have it, take a time to watch that four minute video. It shows you some of these technologies that by me, might be used by some persons with disabilities in your classroom. And the other thing that I was really enthused about and I think is appropriate for visualizations and techniques of taking big data into visualizations like you guys talked about yesterday is that there is a growing group of folks under the Diagram Center, Digital Image and Graphic Resources for Accessible Materials, where they have, um, they're trying to set some standards on how you create metadata for an image so that some of this assistive technology will consistently read it to the student. It may give them a very full description of what that graph is showing, and even if it's a multi-dimensions, or it might be, as some students are wanting, they're almost like wanting a hashtag in less than 144 characters. So that's a personal preference that you will find out. OK. Um, also be cognizant that not everybody has full color vision, uh, a percentage of the male population, regardless of ethnic background, is uh, colorblind for RGB. And so when you're making visualizations, when you're making statistical charts that have solid lines consistently in solid colors, I would like to suggest to you, not only do you color code it, but how about not make them all the same lines? Make them where they're distinctive widths or their dash dot. Something that if you could only see in grayscale, could you still get the information? And I know that I have made diagrams where I've forgotten to do that. Then I stop and I look at it and I go, this would be more impactful and more um, open to diversity if we also use dashes and hashes and things to discern the line, not just the color. So please think about that as you're creating your uh, dissemination products. And then very rapidly, my husband is a geophysicist. I'm a geoscientist, but he tinkers at night when he's doing his IT oil company job. And he's created a 3D printer at home for a couple hundred dollars. And so he and I have been collaborating on how to make 3D models currently of landforms that aren't just, here's a landform, it kind of looks like the shape of Mount St. Helens, or it kind of looks like the shape of the Marianas Trench. We took great detail to go in and actually figure out for the platform that we're working on, the true scale. So that if you took a millimeter ruler out, and you had students doing measurements in millimeters and knowing how to do scale, they're going to get the appropriate proportions and dimensions. Okay, And so we presented at GSA last fall about this. And we have released at least three models so far on this place called Thingiverse. And if you're into techie stuff, it's MakerBot type products. We didn't use a model. We didn't have the $2,000 to buy that. So we made it from um, wiring and soldering. And our teenage daughter helped do that. So she, that really enthused her on learning how to do it. But we've re released these so that you can use them. And uh, if you click at that website for thingiverse.com, you'll see there's a growing population of scientists that are actually putting out models of various types to teach chemistry, raised dot um, diagrams for chemistry. There's the Geofab Lab in, I think it's Northern Iowa or just uh, Iowa State. 
they friended us. But these are some of the computer screenshots of the freeware, the various freeware software we use to get it into the STL file. STL is what people are going to take to whatever printer they have at their school or at Kinko's, and then they're going to print out that object. Okay? So we have, for your enjoyment, um, Mary S. Trench. So you can go there and download the STL file, and also we put uh, an audio captioned transcripted tutorial for you and some other background information in the abstract. Blanco Fracture Zone and the San Andreas Garlock Faults for those of you that want to get back on land. Okay, so welcome to have that. And we run out of time for this, but here are some questions to think about in the broader scale as you try to diversify computational geosciences. How can you put universal design type techniques for better student success in all levels of classroom or teaching environments, whether it's a formal classroom or it's a field-based classroom, okay? And make it learner-centered. And how can you use this usability? And this is what my colleague over at the University of Arkansas, she recently said she stopped using the term universal design because she saw faculty coming to mandatory new faculty orientations rolling their eyes backward like, I don't have time for this. My R1 does not appreciate this in my productivity. So when she uses usability, that equates to efficiencies of your time. Again, this muddies the waters for doing literature searches. But how can you use this as an inter integral part of your program? Because like I said before, persons with disabilities can be in any of the populations that we have discussed so far or the populations that I mentioned in my list to open up, like English language learners. So hopefully I've given you kind of a little quick taste of major needs, um, strategies that could be productive for you. The documents are here for you. And um, we didn't get a chance to discuss. Also, by the way, what I've provided for you, if you would like, it's a two-sided essay, a personal essay I had to write before I attended one of the SAGE 2YCs. And this one was about promoting student success uni using universal design to decrease barriers in ed. This is the one that has the resources outside of science. Thank you very much. And thank you for your extension of time. Questions? I'll just uh, offer a suggestion for some additional resource, which is a software program called Kurzweil, 3, Kurzweil 2000, Kurzweil 3000. Anyway, if you look up Kurzweil, um, what's particularly of interest for scientists is that um, it's capable of downloading PDFs, internally scanning it, and then reading it aloud. And speaking as someone who does need text-to-speech software to help me read, um, it's hugely valuable. So you can get books on tape, um, but when you get certain, when you get past a certain level into uh -huh. college, into graduate school, you can no longer get those resources of books on tape. And if unless you're willing to spend hours and give up your sleep to scan books, then that becomes rather inefficient. Um, but what's really wonderful is that as a scientist, so much of your reading actually comes from PDFs. And so now that there's programs that can s internally scan and uh, uh, and then read aloud Kurzweil, it's actually valuable. And in fact, the voice quality, the other thing I will say, and I was really interested when you brought this up about voice quality, the voice quality is actually getting pretty good um, and you can also train it. Um, so it doesn't sound like you're listening to a computer for hours on end. Um, so it's, it's a, a good program. And in fact, I have it on my laptop if anyone would be interested to see how it works. Well, thank you very much for that. That's an excellent project, uh, product my students